We're talking about how we can hack our brain to improve every single area of our life. Hey, Clutterbugs, welcome back to the Clutterbug podcast. I'm just going to go off on a tangent today. We are going to talk about some crazy brain hacky things that we can do to improve every single area of our life. But specifically, we're going to talk about money. We're going to talk about our home, maybe some relationships, and just generally being a smarter, more productive person. That's the hopes anyways. Disclaimer, I'm not a scientist, a therapist. I really don't know what I'm talking about, but I have noticed some really cool correlations between like ways that we can change our thought process and the results that we can see in my own life. So I can only talk from my own experience, but also I have seen this in friends and family and clients. And so I'm excited about this. I'm, I like nerd out on this type of stuff because it is dramatic. It is drastic changes and it can happen really quickly, but it doesn't take a lot of work. And you know, I'm all about that. I'm all about the shortcuts, having a better life without having to be this crazy workaholic that has a ton of self-discipline. That's, isn't that what we all want? Don't we all want the good stuff out of life? And what if we could get it just by changing a few ways that we see the world and think about the world and some thoughts, we can catch the thoughts we currently have and just replace them with other thoughts. And I know that's called mindfulness. And before your eyes glaze over, I'm going to show you some practical ways, some real things. And we're going to talk about sciencey stuff, like how your brain actually works and how your current neuro pathways, I could be saying all this wrong, but, but, but your current thought processes, how they can really be sabotaging you. I want to talk about this with you because this is something that I've been obviously thinking about a lot recently. And I'm trying to notice patterns in my own life of when things are going really, really well and when things are not going so well, or I'm not improving or having the you know results that I'm looking for. What's the correlation? Like what's different? What am I doing different? So, cause I'm always trying to hack my life because <laughs> I'm lazy friends, but also I want all the good stuff. So while you're listening to me ramble today and talk about a whole bunch of different things, again, I hope you're taking action on your home while you listen, because hopefully you're going to not only have some motivation and inspiration out of this, but learn a few things, but why not double down on that and also get the benefit of catching up on laundry or cleaning the kitchen, emptying and loading the dishwasher, tidying, maybe vacuuming, dusting, whatever it is that you're doing. Or if you're driving in the car, that's cool too. You're getting to a destination, but why not get two things at the same time out of listening to this podcast? So please, if you can, if you have the ability, get up and take action while we talk about how to hack your brain to have an awesomer more amazeballs life. Let's start just talking about how our brain kind of works in the first place. Now, again, I'm not an expert, but I do know that we have these neural pathways. We have like little pathways that are created every time we learn something new, every time we do something new, every time we have a thought, when we want our arm to move, when we want to walk, there's pathways that kind of go from one point, point A to point B and make all of this wonderful stuff happen. And there's a lot of different parts of our brain that control our thoughts and how we perceive things and movement. And it, none of that matters. The point is our brain has something called neuroplasticity, which means we can change and we are changing every minute of the day, those neural pathways. Here's an example. Every time the alarm goes off, my brain says, hit snooze. 
because that's a neural pathway that I'm like, I want five more minutes of sleep without even thinking I'm hitting snooze. So a lot of habits are these predetermined neural pathways, but also walking. We want to get up. We want to move. Our brain just kind of does a lot of these things without thinking, but neuroplasticity means that it's always changing. And we also have something called synaptic pruning, which means if we're not using certain parts of our brain and certain thought processes and certain neurons are not firing, our brain kind of snips those off like when we're pruning a tree. So we're like, we're not using these, but those can go. And we're putting more energy into these that are being used over and over and over again. What I find really fascinating is say you, for whatever reason, stop walking. Did you know that maybe you're laid up and you're in a bed? It only takes a couple of weeks and or at max a few months for your brain to kind of forget your natural gait, to forget how to walk. Now it's really easy to learn again, but I mean, if you go a full year, not walking, even if you're getting the the muscle, like you're doing physio and they're like moving your legs. So you're not losing muscle mass. You have to kind of retrain your brain to walk. So, and that's something we've done since we were a baby. That is a, that is a thick, that is a, that is a really, you know, <laughs> ingrained neuro pathway or multiple neuro pathways in our brain, how to walk. But even that can be altered by not using it. And so why I'm talking about this is it's so fascinating because if there are things, and we're going to talk about this, that we've stopped doing like learning, doing new things, we are going to have parts of our brains that are rewired and changed. And we're going to be this is going to sound bad. I'm just going to say it. <laughs> when we stop educating ourselves and learning new things and learning new skills as adults, we can get dumber. There, I said it. You know, you when you were a kid and your mom was like, watching TV all day will rot your brain. Looking at a screen all day will rot your brain. No, like legit, it doesn't rot your brain. But while we're engaging in consuming that type of media, our brain is less active. We're zoned out. We're, we're, we're not thinking. We're just watching and consuming. And so repeatedly not thinking and not being creative and not doing anything but consuming, blah, you know, this thing, it's, it's called synaptic pruning. Parts of our brain that do the thinking and do the the problem solving and do that, that sort of critical learning aspects are no longer firing. And we actually see scientists see that if you spend hours a day, just mindlessly watching a screen, you actually have less brain matter. You actually have less, you're dumber there. I said it. Okay. But that's not like a forever kind of thing, because that's why we know about neuroplasticity, that we can create new neural pathways at any time. And now you're, you may be glazing over, or I'm going to get to the part that why this really matters. We can at any moment, not only increase our brain mass, thicken our prefrontal cortex, thicken our gray matter, create new neural pathways. Um, so we can get smarter at any moment, but we can also create new pathways, which is basically like a new habit too, at any moment. And more than that, just like not even physical habits, but thought processes. And I'm just going to like, let's, let's just jump in because you're like, what is she even talking about? Here's an example. I was in the bathroom getting ready. And I was like, while I was doing my hair, I was flipping through Facebook and this ad came up and I just listened to it. And this woman said something that really struck me. She said she went to a conference and she went to see this spiritual leader and he walked out on stage in front of thousands of people and he pulled out his wallet and he pulled out a huge stack of like hundred dollar bills and he spread the money out and he was like fanning it for the audience. And he said, you know what? I love money. I love money. I love what it gives me. I love 
I love the fact that I, I look at it and I know I have a lot of money and money is one of the things I, I love most in life. And she was watching this and she immediately thought, oh, gross. That guy's, I like, I, I have a like, ooh, like a visceral reaction of what a jackhole. And he's obviously not a spiritual person. And he's obviously not a good person because he loves money and I don't like him. And then what the man continued saying is you probably in the audience, some of you had a really negative reaction to me saying that I like money. You probably thought that I wasn't actually a spiritual person. I wasn't a good person. And she was like, oh my, is he reading my mind? And he followed that up by saying, it's that thought process that many people have that money is bad, that money is to, to like money is greedy and wrong to want to collect money and, and, and have a lot of money makes you a bad person. It's that thought process that stops us from being wealthy. Wow. And when she, she, I mean, she was, I'm sure she was selling something. I switched off as soon as she said that I found that so incredible because it's absolutely true. And there was a lot of years that I struggled with scarcity mindset and I struggled in poverty. I didn't have a lot of money. For some reason, the thought of saving money, I don't know, it was like a subconscious thought, but it felt really greedy and wrong. And I looked at people who had a lot of money and I was like, they're bad people. And I definitely looked at the 1% and was like, those greedy jerks, you know, they're, they're terrible people because they save money all the time and, and money's kind of evil and bad. So if I thought this about money and I repeatedly had these neuro pathways in my brain that when we think about money, we instantly think negative thoughts. Of course, I'm not going to want to save. I'm not going to want to grow wealth. I'm not going to want to take actions in my life to increase the amount of money that I have. Even though I say like, I need more money. I want more money. I hate being broke all the time. There's also another part of my brain that actively kind of pushes money away. And I, I struggled with this for a very long time. And I'm saying this because this might be a mindset that you have as well without even realizing it, that you look at money and you think about money as of in a very negative, toxic way. So our brain, in order to protect us from those thoughts is always running in the background, doing things, developing, you know, systems and, and pathways and thought ways to avoid things that we think are negative. And a lot of people say this is goes along with mindfulness and manifestation. If you change your thought process, magically the universe will make you rich. I really don't think that's what's happening. I think this is there's a more scientific, more logical, more fact-based thing going on. It's our brain changing those thought processes, changing those neuro pathways from money is negative to money is positive. And then we want, and we do start saving more and spending less and, and getting out of that scarcity mindset. So I had to do a lot of work on this. And I remember it was probably 10 years ago. I was still really, really, I struggled with money. Whenever my husband would talk about, he, we would get a bonus or we would get some extra money or in every paycheck, we would be putting away 10%. We'd get some extra. He's like, we should save it. We should save it. We should save it. I had a really visceral negative reaction to that. Like we have enough. This feels selfish and wrong. We should be giving to others or we should be spending it on things um, because having a, a lot of money in the bank for some reason, like makes you a bad person. And I went to this conference and Martha Stewart was there and I was so excited to see her speak live. I mean, it's Martha freaking Stewart, right? Um, and she got up on stage and, and she said, I didn't know I made it until I was driving down Rodeo drive or something. And I looked around and I realized I could buy 
every single building I saw for as far as the eye could stretch. I was rich enough to buy everything here. And that's how I knew I had made it. I have so much money. I don't even know what to do with it. And I felt such hatred for this woman who up until then, I like really was like, she's iconic and I love her and it's Martha Stewart. And to see her on stage and my perception of her bragging about money, um, I instantly thought, ew, she's a gross, horrible person. And I hate her, hate her. And I remember leaving and actually telling a bunch of people who, who asked me, how was you, you know, the talk with Martha Stewart and, and did you enjoy it? And I'm like, oh no, she's a dirt bag. She's a dirt bag because she acknowledged her own wealth publicly. And looking back on that now, I realized she also probably was doing the work to start changing her own thought process about money and her own kind of, yeah, how she relates and, and being brave enough to talk about the fact that something that is, we all already know, we know Martha Stewart's rich, but to have her say, yeah, I'm rich was like, oh, you're a bad person for acknowledging what, what is absolutely true and what everyone in the world already knows. Um, don't talk about it. Don't brag about it. Don't see money as a positive thing. That is all crap. And I've had to read a ton of self-help books and Dave Ramsey books and a lot of like women empowerment books about money to realize the reason I was keeping myself broke for so long was because I really did have a fear and I really of, of saving. And I really thought that having enough money to make myself feel safe was dirty. And I certainly felt like talking about saving money or, or having financial freedom was super gross and wrong. And I've had to work really hard on that. And I'm part of a group of other women entrepreneurs and we all get together and I'm like, can we just, can we just be brave enough to talk about how we earn money and how we save money? And let's, can we just talk about money? Because why is it this dirty little secret? And I think when we really work on ourselves and we see that money is a positive thing because it gives us security, because it allows us to protect our family, because it allows us to pay our bills, because it gives us a peace of mind and safety, because it gives us the ability to help other people who are in need, because the more we save money makes us money. If we can invest that money, even in, in safe investments, our money can now make us money. Our money is no longer something that we just work to earn so we can buy things, but we now see it as this, this beautiful thing that protects us. When we make that mindset sh set, set shift and we repeat these things over and over and we uh, surround ourselves with like audiobooks and and listening and and other people talking and changing our neuro pathways cutting off all those pathways that tell us that money is bad and talking about money is gross and saving money is wrong and rich people are bad human beings that kind of all goes away and we've created new neuro pathways that is like it's not selfish to want to feel safe and to have enough money for a rainy day. And money isn't a bad thing and it isn't the root of all evil and it isn't horrible. It's a necessary part of life and it can be a really positive thing. And we start opening ourselves up to more opportunities and changing the way we think about it. And we'll see positive results like our savings account will start going up. Now let's talk about the same exact thing, but with our home. For a very long time, I thought that people who cleaned all the time were neurotic. My mom was a clean freak. So I grew up in a home where I was constantly not only shamed for the state of my messy room, but told that like you measure yourself worth based on what your house looked like. And anytime I would try to get tidy, I would fail. Anytime I tried to clean or declutter, like my natural state is messy. And so therefore, I guess I'm a bad person. Like there was this weird correlation. 
And so as I got older and I started going off on my own, I really, I really rejected and avoided all kind of cleaning and decluttering. And unless I absolutely had to, because it was so bad, it got mortifyingly embarrassing, but on a daily basis, as like a, just part of my natural state, picking up after myself, tidying after myself, I was already like kind of chaotic and messy. And so I didn't want to clean. I struggled obviously with letting go and housework, but the biggest struggle was the fact that I told myself not only that I was bad at it, that I sucked at it, um, that I was going to fail anyways, that what's the point, but I was also telling myself, I didn't want to be like my mother, that people who clean all the time are gross, bad, neurotic like exact opposite of what I want to be. I want to be a free spirit. I want to be creative. I want to, you know, be, I, I want to love and embrace my chaotic self. So therefore I can't have a clean house. This is the neuro pathway that I created and reinforced over and over and over and over again. And again, this is how our brain works. When we have a thought process, there are parts of our brain that are always looking to reinforce this thought process. So I would look around and I would see people with clean houses and I'd be like, oh yeah, see, she's neurotic or see, she, she doesn't have a life. This is all she does all the time. It's all I could see was the negative aspects of cleaning and having a clean house. And I had made this a story that had, you know, it was like a novel, the story that I told myself about why I didn't even want to be a clean person anyways. Right. And, but I did want to have a clean house, but the work I had to do was more than just decluttering and putting stuff into trash bags, which was important. And, you know, creating new habits of cleaning all the time. I also had to change those. I had to have some synaptic pruning of all those little negative things that I had told myself. I had to stop feeding those thoughts, catch myself doing them and replace them with new thoughts. Like I'm not messy. I just organize differently and I deserve a clean house and I don't have to be neurotic and clean all the time. And having a clean house does not make me some sort of crazy clean freak. It makes me happy, it makes me happy and, and feel in control. And I have more time and I had to train my brain to think about housework differently, to think about organization differently. And I did this by listening to a lot of Peter Walsh reading a lot of his books, reading other books, Julie Morgenstein, just replacing my current thoughts with other thoughts, more positive thoughts. When I changed the way I thought about cleaning, when I started seeing it as positive and a positive experience and telling myself over and over again, like good, you know, uplifting things, I started wanting to clean more. And I started doing things more subconsciously because my brain wasn't actively trying to help me get out of it because it's like, you know, this is bad. This is negative. You're, this is a horrible thing. I'm going to help you avoid this at all costs because that's what our brain does. It, it seeks out dopamine and happiness and, and good things. And it tries to make us not feel the, the bad that that's what it's there for. That's its whole goal. So when we're telling it that having a clean house is bad, it's going to do everything it can to help us avoid the act of cleaning or having a clean house. It's going to sabotage that because we've told it to, and we've trained it to. And this is what I mean by brain hacks. And yeah, this is called mindfulness, but Ugh, when you, people say that, like, you can just meditate your way to happiness or, or whatever. Like, I don't know. I feel like I know what the gurus are saying when they're talking about mindfulness, but I also want the science and the how to, and the, like, why this works. I want to see like, 
real life examples of things that I can do. I just have to listen to audiobooks and podcasts or read books. I just have to catch myself having those negative thoughts and like maybe write down some positive thoughts I can have instead. You can listen to podcasts like this, like right now, as you're listening to me talk about housework and cleaning differently, I am helping you create a new neural pathway. When we talk about decluttering and the fact that your stuff is not money, that the money has already been spent and you are not richer for holding on to it, that is changing how you think. And maybe not overnight, but slowly that thought process is going to be changing, which means decluttering is going to be easier for you. Because now you know, you've heard me say, and you've heard other people say that, that letting go equals more time that letting go of the stuff that you don't use and love means more peace of mind because it's less stress because every single thing you own is work. It's something you have to manage and remember where it is and clean it and stuff shuffle and manage that mess. And you deserve better. Less stuff equals a better life and stop. When you hear this message over and over again, you are developing a new neural pathway. You are changing your thought process. You are strengthening not just that muscle. When we talk about strengthening a decluttering muscle, it's a freaking brain muscle. That's why it's easier. And eventually this becomes just a, a habit. So just ingrained in us that it becomes second nature and it's easy and it no longer feels hard and emotional. We got to do the work with the brain. And that looks like continued learning. It looks like catching those negative thoughts and replacing them with positive thoughts. And this is easier to do when those positive thoughts are coming from outside sources. So instead of just mindlessly watching television and turning our brain off, what if we're listening to a podcast or an audiobook, or we're reading a book or we're actively engaging in problem solving in our space by doing the physical work of decluttering, literally being smarter in these areas and being better at it and growing as a person and leveling up. When we think about all the things we learned when we were in public school and high school, and if you went on to post-secondary education, we were learning, we were training our brain, we were growing, we were becoming better people, better versions of ourselves with every piece of knowledge that we gained. And for some reason, as we become adults, we just like stop that and we come, become really stagnant. And when I look at all the people in my life that I look up to and I admire, and I'm like, I want to be like them. And I've said this before, and I'm going to say it again, every successful person, and I measure success differently. I measure success by, you know, their relationships, their overall happiness. Yeah. Their financial stability is important too. So I, it's like, we talk about the five areas of your life to master. I have another podcast on that, that I've talked about the five areas of your life, that if you can have all of these under control, I feel like you've really mastered success. When I look at people who are doing that and really succeeding in all these areas of their life, there's one thing that all these people have in common. One thing that I notice again and again and again. They all engage in learning on a daily basis to better themselves. And it's equaling to like this incredible life. And I know my own life looking back, I, I'm a self-help book junkie, but it has been a good year since I've really read a new self-help book. I've fallen out of the practice of listening to self-help books while I clean or while I drive or while I'm doing things. In this past year, I haven't seen any real growth. So how can I ignore that correlation? I can't. What's different between the five years previous where every year I did something incredible and I really leveled up and I improved and 
one area or another in a really drastic way, what's the difference between this last year that felt very stagnant for me where I didn't have any personal growth? I wasn't, I wasn't learning. And maybe I was having synaptic pruning because I wasn't actively engaging those pathways towards a, a happier, healthier, more successful life. You're already listening to this podcast, so obviously you're already <laughs> working on improving your home and how it looks. Look back and, and see how far you've come and be proud of yourself and realize how that happened, that you did that by changing the way you think about housework. And that doesn't mean, and, and decluttering and organization, that doesn't mean you're there and you're at the top of the mountain and you've achieved it, but look how far you've come. How can you keep going in this area, but add a new area that you want to improve to? Maybe it's relationships, read relationship books, read books on, I don't know, how to talk to people and how to strengthen your marriage or your relationship with your children or listen to podcasts or watch YouTube videos about that. Maybe it is money. There's so many resources. Maybe it's your health and fitness. That's what I got to work on. So many resources to go to. We don't have to change every, we don't have to like start getting up and changing habits. We just have to change our thoughts first. There are a million self-help books out there and I'm, I'm, I'm going to get back into it. That's what I've decided today after listening to that lady on Facebook talk about, you know, how I, how gross money is and how I used to think the exact same thing. And then realizing, wow, like Dave Ramsey changed how I thought about money. And I read books like rich dad, poor dad and the wealthy barber and, and a bunch of, of books on automatic millionaire. God, I could go on and on and on. It changed the way I thought about money. And then my brain changed how I see money and how I react to money. And then my money situation changed. Yeah. And the same thing happened with my house and organization and decluttering. And I did the exact same thing in so many different areas of my life. And now I'm like, I'm going to get back into this because it's as easy as listening to a freaking audiobook or podcast about that subject. Here's another example before I let you go. I saw multiple therapists a few years ago, but it was really helpful. But the thing that was the most helpful was the way that I thought about my husband and how much he helped out around the house. So I saw myself as doing all the housework and, and everything and all the cooking and the cleaning. And I did do more. And that's the truth. I did a lot more, but I really told myself that he was lazy and that he never helped ever, never helped. And I thought this thought all the time. So it was reinforced. And then my brain, because I had this thought process everywhere I looked, I was always looking for how he was never helping me. I was always looking for examples to prove subconsciously that, yep, he didn't take out the garbage again and see, he didn't put his dishes in the dishwasher and look, and all I noticed everywhere I looked are the ways that he was failing me. And I became really, really resentful. And there was a time in my marriage that I was like, I don't want to be with this person anymore because he's so disrespectful of me and he's not helpful. And all I saw was all the bad things that he did. And this therapist who I was hoping would say, yeah, your husband's a piece of garbage. <laughs> That's what I wanted her to say as I vented to her. She said, okay, here's a piece of paper. And she gave me like this worksheet. And every day she wanted me to write down three things, three ways that he did help and find the opposite. And I was no longer allowed to focus on the negative, but I had to really look for the positive. And I was so like, ugh, like what? He doesn't do hardly anything. It's going to be really hard for me to find ways that he's helpful, lady, you know? Like, okay. She's like, okay, so next week I want seven pages. I'm going to see you in a week. I want to see seven pages and every page has like three things or more filled out of ways that he was helpful that day and things that he did that day. And so I looked and I was like, okay, I'm going to do the work because I'm paying this lady, whatever, 
an hourly wage and and she says to do this so like i'm gonna prove to her that it's impossible and i I got home and i was like oh he took the garbage out okay i'll write that down he took the garbage out and then i went inside and i'm like oh he actually i mean he didn't totally clean the kitchen but he emptied and loaded the dishwasher i noticed a few things he didn't do and he didn't wipe the counter and he didn't stop it Cass. he did empty and load the dishwasher and put the kids dishes in. So I wrote that down. And then I was like, Oh, oh gosh. Oh, I think he put away a load of laundry. He didn't start another one. He didn't switch this one over again. Stop. He put away a load of laundry. And then the next day I practiced this again and again and again, and this insane freaking thing happened. You guys, I started noticing all the positive ways that my husband was helping. And I saw more and more and more. And I started like being less resentful. And I started like noticing things I had never noticed before. He always gets up in the morning and takes the kids to school. So I get to sleep in and he makes me a coffee and he puts it by my bed and, and he makes dinner half the time. And he's much better at grocery shopping than I am. And he always takes the kids to hockey and he coaches them and he does all these things and he takes out the trash and he breaks down the boxes and I just chuck them out in the garage in a big, huge, big pile. And he doesn't say anything and he breaks them down and puts them into the recycling and he pays the bills and he takes care of the finances. And he, and I really, wow, I was like, wow, boy, he does a lot more. And my relationship improved so much. It was nuts. And the only thing that changed is how I looked at him. He wasn't actually doing any more. I was just noticing the good instead of the bad. And I started falling in love with him all over again. And I started talking to him more positively. And the more that I did that, then the more I I praised him for all the good things I noticed instead of nagging for all the bad things, the more good things he wanted to do. And I call this the cookie method because all human beings want to be rewarded for the things that we do. And the more we're rewarded with positive things for doing activities, the more we want to do those activities because we want the positive, right? Yeah. And the more we are, you know, not rewarded and we have a negative thing. So we'll say he loads the dishwasher wrong and I complain and I, you know, shame him for the way he loaded the dishwasher. He didn't wipe the counters after he cleaned the kitchen. The next time he goes to clean the kitchen, he's going to associate that with negative and he's not going to want to do it. But if I praise him, I'm like, oh my gosh, thank you. You loaded the dishwasher and that was so amazing and helpful. And you're a great husband. The next time he walks into the kitchen, he's going to associate cleaning the kitchen with positive and he's going to do it more. And it works for us as well. It works for our kids. It works for everyone. And so not only did this activity make me notice more positive things about my husband and improve my relationship and let help me let go of resentment and love him more, but it was positive for him as well, because when I praised and put a spotlight on the good things that he was doing, he started doing those good things more. Yeah, pretty magical. And it works for you as well. When you put a spotlight on the positive things you're doing and you kind of stop putting spotlights on the negative things that you're doing, the same exact effect works for yourself and your brain and your kids and everyone else. There is science behind this. We can hack our own brain. We can help hack other people's brains around us, and we can improve every single aspect of our lives when we do the work and we remind ourselves of the work that needs to be done. And we keep strengthening those neuropathways by listening to these positive messages from other people, reading them in books, listening to podcasts or audiobooks. I'm beating a dead horse. I keep saying it here. I love you guys. I hope you're feeling inspired today to, to think about an, another area of your life that you want to improve and how you can do it. How can you do that today? What other gurus can you look to? What exercises can you practice? What audiobooks? 
YouTube videos can you listen that are not just mindless entertainment, but life improving skills? Okay. Thank you guys so much. Love you. And I'll see you guys next time.